another challenge. So. All right, well, the lights are on on the TV now, so. Oh, really? Yeah, I think they're expecting us to start. By the way, the code for the the uh, Wi-Fi mm -hmm. uh, 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 capitalized FCC eight two three three zero two eight two three three zero two. Yep. Okay. And have we opened the call bridge yet? They probably have. Okay. Usually goes live about five minutes before nine. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Seems like we're having a little bit of a slower start. I heard there was some sort of hockey thing that happened last night <laughs> that uh, might be causing some traffic. And Metro home. was a little <laughs> slow this morning, so um, hopefully everyone ends up showing up and Should didn't we do celebrate. A sobriety test <laughs> right. for everybody this morning. <laughs> um, just checking: is the are, do we have folks on the phone line? Yes, we do. Sure do. Perfect. Uh, so. Yep. I think Scott has a couple logistical items. Um, name cards are on the table by the far set of doors, um, if you haven't gotten that yet. Uh, so please grab your name card, make your way to the table. Scott's going to do some other logisticals. It's far Where's to your way? right. Far, far to my way. It's oh, okay. <laughs> this is the boarding house reach for a microphone. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, and for those of you who are out of town, you have no idea how nice this weather is in Washington. We don't get much nice weather without heat and humidity in this town. Um, just wait until June or July. Just be thankful we don't meet in July or August. But anyway, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we, uh, for those of you who have not been here before, welcome. and. Uh, You'll, uh, you'll find uh, the restrooms right straight out this door to my right. Uh, go to the intersecting corridor and turn left going toward the lobby where you checked in and the restrooms are on your left. Um, we will be changing uh, our, our schedule a little bit today to make it uh, conform with some of the practices of other committees and giving that a try. And that's why we are having our plenary meeting until noon adjourning around noon and then having our working group uh, breakout sessions um, that are private, they're not public meetings, they're not broadcast like our plenary meeting is, uh, in the afternoon. And we have those staggered between uh, one and three. And uh, in your meeting packet, there is a document that, uh, that gives the time and locations for those meetings, as well as the dial-in instructions for the bridge for each one of those rooms. If you have any questions, ask me or Catherine. Catherine, are you in the room? No, she's busy doing all the work that's behind the scenes of this thing. Um, anyway, um, ask, uh, when she gets back, or you can ask me, um, and we'll also get you to the rooms. That it's really quite easy. The, we'll be using the, this room for, our, uh, for some of the breakouts, um, especially for showing video or something. And then the other uh, breakouts will be in uh, the room, again, right down this corridor to my right, uh, past the intersecting corridor. And in that corridor, it's one of the usual breakout rooms that we use, uh, 402, 442. Anyway, uh, anything else to add, no, and I, Mr. I, Chairman? I hope that everybody will plan to stay through the working group sessions, because as you know, those are important to the work that we do. Absolutely. And it's one of the few opportunities we have to do them in person. Um, is when we're here for these full day meetings. Uh, I thought it might be helpful to go around and do introductions, but before we do that, I wanted to make sure that we thanked Ross Lieberman and ACA for providing breakfast and lunch for us today. Um, we're much more productive when we're well fed, so thank you, Ross. That's very much appreciated. <laughs> um, so we'll do a quick uh, round of intros. I'm Ed Bartholomew with Call for Action. I'm Scott Marshall, and I work for Ed and, and all of you, and, and the chairman. So I've got a, f a few bosses. Yeah, good morning <laughs> again. All right. Good morning, I'm Howard Rosenblum. Hi, Howard. Howard Rosenblum? Yeah. 
with Deaf and Hard of Hearing Consumer Action Network, Advocacy Network, um, and I am myself work with the National Association for the Deaf. I wanted to ask Scott, you said you have a lot of bosses. Who's your favorite boss? <laughs> uh, they're all my favorites, each and every one. How's that for a good answer? <laughs> okay, accept, accepted response. Okay. And give uh, Zainab, uh, who's on maternity leave, our best, too, when you see her. Uh, Louisa Lanchetti here, representing T-Mobile. Uh, Debbie Berlin, representing the National <laughs> Consumers League, and Rock in the Red. Oh, I mean, yeah. hello. Yes. Go, Caps. Go Caps. Good morning, Francello Chilo, National Hispanic Media Coalition. Uh, Ricky Alvad from Fairfax County, Virginia, representing the TOA. Uh, Paul Goodman, on behalf of the Center for Media Justice and the Media Action Grass Grassroots Network. Thaddeus Johnson with the Office of the People's Council for the District of Columbia on behalf of Nasuka. Dawit Kasai with AARP. Olivia Wine, National Consumer Law Center, also rocking the red. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, I'm Rachel Nemeth with the Consumer Technology Association. Susan Grant, Consumer Federation of America. I guess I'm rocking the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Lynn Follinsby, U.S. Telecom, also rocking the red. <laughs> Mark DeFalco with the Appalachian Regional Commission. Ross Lieberman, American Cable Association. Steve Morris, NCTA. Good morning, Jocelyn Day, the Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Hi, I'm uh, Gaurav Loria here for Free Press uh, instead of Dana Floberg this morning. And on the phone? <coughs> On the phone. Hi, this is Amina Fazula with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Kevin Taglank from the Benton Foundation. Steve Posey. Kyle Hildebrand. Go ahead. Sorry, Kyle Hildebrand, individual. Yeah, and this is Steve Posey also with the American Consumer Institute. Larry Walk, National Association of Broadcasters. Corlett Hannon with AARP. Anyone else on the line? And we had one person sneak in. Hi, Chris Witnowski, CTIA. Uh, quick reminder, um, raise your hand to activate the microphone in front of you when you want to speak. Name cards are one-sided, so if you can see your name, none of the rest of us can see your name, so turn it around. Uh, and when you do want to say something, flip it up like this so that we know that you're sort of in the question queue or the comment queue. Uh, Next on the agenda, we have the chairman joining us in person um, in about five minutes. So we'll sort of hang close to the table, maybe freshen up your coffee if you want to, um, and then we'll get going as soon as the chairman arrives.
I think we're ready to get going if everybody wants to hustle back. I, I know coffee is an important thing after, after what was probably a little bit longer evening for many of us last night with the hockey game. So next up this morning, we're excited to be joined by Chairman Pai, who's going to be providing us with some remarks this morning. And I think he, he was here, is here. <laughs> I'll stop looking around and just sit patiently at this point. <laughs> I'll be back. Right. <coughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you want to start with the CPD people or with an interrupt? Yeah. yeah. Hey guys, can you get started with the CPD update? You want us to get started? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, uh, let's then do we'll that. have to interrupt you. Anything? I think uh, while we wait for the chairman, we're going to get started with our CGB sure. update. Um, well, once I get going, I'm not yielding the seat. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just fair warning. Um, fair warning. You might want to change right. the 10 card. <laughs> well, it's the end of the pay period today, so yeah. Um, <laughs> Patrick Weber was planning on being here with us, but had a conflict and sends his regrets. So we're thrilled to be joined by Mark Stone, who's going to start us off with, a, with an update on the, the work that CGB has been doing since our last meeting. So welcome, Mark. Thank you, Ed. Uh, good to see all of you. As Ed mentioned, um, our bureau chief has uh, had an unavoidable conflict today, so he sends his regrets. Um, so I want to give you an update on some of the policy work we've been doing in the bureau. Uh, we've been busy since your last meeting working on robocalls and slamming and cramming. Um, in the robocalls arena, um, in March, the commission addressed an issue called that we refer to as reassigned phone numbers issue. Um, in a nutshell, that's the case where um, a caller tries to reach a consumer that gave consent to get a robocall, um, but that number that the consumer was at is subsequently reassigned to a new consumer. So that creates a problem where the consumer who wants to get the call no longer gets it. The consumer who inherited the reassigned phone number misses a call that they want, and then, of course, the caller wastes their time um, trying to reach the wrong person. So in, in the March NPRM, the commission took steps to address the problem. Specifically, it proposed to ensure that uh, one or more databases are available to callers with comprehensive and timely information they need to avoid calling reassigned numbers. Um, it sought comment on the information that callers who choose to use a reassigned numbers database uh, need to avoid the information they need to avoid calling reassigned numbers. And then finally, sought feedback on three alternative ideas for service providers to report that information. First, requiring service providers to report reassign number information to a single FCC designated database. Um, second, requiring service providers to report that information, that same information to one or more commercial data aggregators. Or third, allowing service providers to report that information to cons commercial aggregators um, on a voluntary basis. Is that a good breaking point? That might be a good breaking point. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the, I noticed the chairman's joined us, so we'd like to welcome him up now to provide his remarks. I know you've got a busy schedule today, and we want to be respectful of your time. <laughs> uh, thanks, sorry to uh, cause an interruption, and I'm frankly just amazed that anybody is here. I can tell you that <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs had won the Super Bowl after a decades-long drought. I can assure you the last place I would be uh, would be on a voluntary committee meeting uh, on a Friday, no less. So I'm very impressed at all of your dedication and uh, uh, all caps. It's kind of a surreal feeling being in a city that hasn't known a championship for 26 years. We do have lots of red. So. Ah, yeah, no, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So, uh, well, welcome to the uh, summer meeting of the Consumer Advisory Committee. Uh, the last time I uh, met with you in f uh, February, 
I was on the road and so I had to address you through a pre-recorded video message. So to me at least this is much, much better. Uh, first off, I uh, want to thank you all again for sharing your time and your expertise here at the Commission. And special thanks to the CAC's leadership team, especially your Chairman Ed uh, and Scott Marshall who runs Point from the FCC's perspective. Uh, this committee provides a tremendous value to the Commission by bringing in experts, advice from consumer advocates and the private sector. And what's notable is that this committee tackles such a wide uh, array of issues. In fact, today's agenda, I think, is reflective of that broad portfolio. Um, I'll just briefly highlight our work on a few of the issues that I know you're going to be talking about. And uh, uh, there's some recent work, including up to yesterday, uh, many of the issues that were uh, on tap for the Commission's open agenda meeting. I'll start with 5G, which I understand is the topic of today's second panel. Uh, for the past few years, one of the agency's highest priorities has been repurposing a high band spectrum for next generation wireless connectivity, or 5G, as it's commonly known. Uh, yesterday, the Commission finalized rules for the use of the 24 gigahertz band and advanced the ball on the lower 37 gigahertz band. Uh, we also proposed freeing up even more spectrum for flexible wireless use in the 26 gigahertz band, and the, as well as the 42 gigahertz band. Uh, later this morning, you'll hear from staff regarding the next steps and the details of our plan. Uh, but the big takeaway is that 5G is a huge opportunity for uh, U.S. innovators as well as consumers. We want the United States to be the haven for innovation and investment, and we want our consumers to be able to uh, benefit from the mobile revolution. Uh, next, from mobile to fixed broadband, uh, during my travels across the United States over the last year, uh, some 26 states and the U.S. territories of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, uh, when I speak to consumers, they express great interest in being able to access modern, resilient technologies like optical fiber instead of limping along with slower services like DSL, uh, provided over old, often degraded copper. Uh, to respond to that desire, we adopted an order just yesterday that would make it easier for companies to discontinue outdated legacy services and transition for, to networks of the future. Uh, we want to work with you to minimize uh, the disruptions for consumers during the retirement of legacy networks and ensure that they are able to enjoy the high-speed services that uh, many of us already do. Uh, we also acted yesterday on two subjects that I know are important to you, uh, communications for people with disabilities and slamming and cramming. Uh, on the former, we addressed Internet Protocol Captioned Telephone Service, or IPCTS, uh, which as you know is a service that allows individuals with hearing loss to both read captions and to use the residual hearing to understand a telephone conversation. Uh, the use of IPCTS is paid for through the FCC's TRS fund and has grown exponentially in recent years, representing almost 80% of the total minutes that are compensated out of that fund. Uh, so yesterday we set IPCTS compensation rates uh, that are closer to the actual provider costs, uh, which will put the service on a more sustainable footing going forward. And that is important because we want more of the people who need this service to be able to benefit from it. Uh, and on the cramming and slamming side, we adopted rules that include, for the first time, a clear ban on misrepresentations that are made during sales calls to switch carriers and a clean prohibition against placing unauthorized charges on consumers' phone bills. We also put additional teeth into our anti-slamming rules by clarifying that carriers who abuse uh, our uh, third-party verification process, or TPV, will be suspended from using that service for five years. Uh, with respect to the incentive auction, which I know you're tackling as well, the post-auction broadcast transition is well underway, uh, with scores of stations already transitioning to uh, new channels and markets across the country. Our incentive auction team has regularly briefed this advisory committee on the FCC's efforts to make sure that TV viewers are prepared for these changes, and they're here again today to update you on the particulars. Uh, they'll then lead a discussion with some local stations that have already made their transition and can tell you about some of the lessons that have been learned. And finally, I cannot talk to the Consumer Advisory Committee without talking about uh, my favorite topic, robocalls, uh, <laughs> which is our top consumer protection priority throughout the Commission. Um, over the last several months, we have been busy empowering voice service providers to stop spoofed robocalls from ever reaching consumers' phones, uh, encouraging the development of a call authentication standard, uh, essentially a digital fingerprint for every phone call, and proposing a reassigned numbers database to ensure that callers don't inadvertently call a number that has been reassigned to a new subscriber who may not have been given consent to being called. On top of that, we also approved the largest enforcement penalty ever imposed by the FCC against a robocaller in Florida. 
Uh, now, your recommendations on call blocking, on caller ID authentication, and consumer education have been extremely valuable to our work. And so I thank you for that. And we look forward to more of the same. If you have any ideas on this score that can help us attack mm -hmm. what Senator Fritz Hollings once famously called the scourge of civilization, uh, we would certainly welcome that. Uh, anyway, in the interest of time, I will stop uh, filibustering, uh, apologize to our interpreters for the fast talking, as always, and let you get on with what I know is a very full agenda. But uh, thank you once again for all of your service. I hope you have a productive and happy Friday. And once again, let's go Caps. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Great Thank to you. have you in person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Take care. My pleasure. I think we'll have Mark come back up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, he took my slamming talking to me. Rewrite. So uh, the one last thing I did want to mention again on the robocall score, uh, in addition to what the chairman mentioned, um, uh, the Bureau sought comment on a couple of key terms um, in the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, which is uh, the main uh, anti-robocalls uh, law that we enforce um, and implement here at the FCC. So we did that back last month. We sought comment on key terms and concepts like auto dialer, revocation of consent. Um, and reassign numbers liability, along with a couple of other issues, such as uh, robocalls from federal contractors and other government contractors. Um, so the commission, or the Bureau took this action um, in response to a DC Circuit decision related to TCPA. Um, the comment cycle on that, I believe, closes June 28th. Um, that's about it for me. Okay, thank you, Mark. Yep. Next on the list, we have Karen. I think we have a name card for you, too. Hi, thank you again for having me back. Um, okay, the chairman stole my thunder on IPCTS. <laughs> um, <laughs> Next time, have them come after us. <laughs> um, but um, the IP caption telephone service, actually the chairman only mentioned one of the things that the item does, uh, the rate, lowering of the rate. It also does many other things, um, so I can just mention those really briefly. Um, one of the thing, other things that it does is it seeks to modernize this service to allow for fully automated captioning or fully automated speech recognition. This is a service that generally people who have some hearing um, but not enough to understand the conversation used because what happens is when uh, the, let's say if I'm a person that's hard of hearing, um, I will access this service and then I will be able to use my residual hearing to hear what the other person is saying, but that person is, I'm also connected to uh, what's called a communications assistant who repeats everything that that ser person says and um, reads it into a speech recognition program that then spits out captions that produce, in a better word, generates <laughs> captions that I then read on my caption telephone. Um, because automated speech recognition has uh, improved so dramatically, we always talked about five to 10 years, well, it's kind of here. It's gotten so much better, it literally, in the last year, and then in the last month, and in the last week, every, every day it, it, it improves. We, are, um, we have approved, or the commission has approved, the use of automated speech recognition without that communications assistant involved to generate these captions. So um, the next step is going to be that we are going to receive petitions. We actually already have two that are pending um, th that f from providers that want to provide IP caption telephone service via this new method. So that's a, it's a big deal. It's modernization and we are um, going to make sure that we only approve those who can meet our mandatory minimum standards which will assure functional equivalent service for people who have um, hearing loss. So uh, we want to make very, that very, very clear. We're not going to just let anybody in. We want to make sure that the service provides effective communication. The item also looks at whether or not we should be shifting some of the responsibility for the administration of this service over to the states. States each have their own relay programs. To date, this has been an entirely uh, FCC administered service, and we think it may be time to shift some of the responsibilities, including potentially some of the funding. 
uh, to date, it's only been funded by uh, um, interstate and international carriers, and we have received a petition, and it, the petition is put at, is is noted in the item um, whether or not we should be including intrastate revenues in the support for this service. Just so you know, this service now costs this IPCTS service alone costs about a billion dollars a year. So we're very concerned about getting the service under control, getting the funding under control, and making sure that it's sustainable for the people who need it. In that vein, we're also looking at provider practices and making sure that there are that the marketing practices that are that are occurring are um, legitimate and producing uh, customers who, again, absolutely need the service. I just mentioned that there are state programs that provide relay services, and um, we are also looking at renewing those state certification, um, state program certifications. We do that every five years. Uh, we, this has been going on on a rolling basis. I might have even mentioned it at the last meeting. Most recently, on April 10th, we sent out a request for public comment on the most recent states that apply to get renewed, Illinois, Oregon, um, uh, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania, and uh, comments are due on June 11th. We are also have an open item on what the rates, compensation rates generally should be for all of our relay services. We have many different kinds, not only IPCTS, we have video, we have uh, still TTY, there are many flavors of relay. And um, so we have lots of different rates. And so that is out on public notice by the Bureau, as well as the contribution factor, um, which, how much money we should be collecting from each carrier. And uh, comments are due, I, I don't have the date the comments are due, but we have to resolve that proceeding by June 30th because the, um, the new rates go into effect on July 1st. Something else that you might be interested in is that ITTA filed a petition asking for it to be permissible for telephone companies to include that the fact that there's a surcharge for TRS, for telecommunications relay services, in the, in the description um, in, as a line item charge on customer telephone bills, which is not currently the practice. So um, we issued a public notice on that on May 18th, and comments are due June 18th, and replies are due July 3rd. Um, moving away from Relay, in October we have due our third biennial report to Congress on the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, also known as the CVAA. On April 5th we had released a public notice inviting comment to help prepare that report and we are going to be um, releasing a PN later in the summer to invite comments on tentative findings. It's a two-step process. And generally, we're looking at the level of compliance with accessibility requirements, the extent to which accessibility barriers still exist, and the, the extent to which um, our record keeping and enforcement rules have any effect on the development and deployment of new technologies. Next, in July, July 1st, um, some big changes take place in video description. I think that all of you know what that is, but just in case you don't, it's narratives, inser ins narratives audio narratives inserted into uh, television programs content to uh, provide people who are blind and visually impaired information about what's going on on the screen when there's no dialogue and no audio. And we've had rules uh, uh, since this is a CBA requirement, so we've had rules since 20, around 2012 requiring this on certain television networks and channels. Um, the exciting thing is that beginning J July 1st, the amount of required video programming is going to go up by 75% to 87.5 hours per quarter for each included network. In addition, we um, will be changing the uh, the non-broadcast multi-program uh, distributors that are covered, uh, specifically it's going to be, this is basically cable, the cable channels to make it easier. Um, it will be um, USA, HGTV, TBS, Discovery, and History. Um, and of course ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC will continue to be covered. We also have um, the commission, and not necessarily our bureau, but we we in the disability unit of our bureau watch carefully what the Public Safety Bureau does. So the Public Safety Bureau has been doing an enormous amount of work. If, for any of you who have followed 
Um, I just wanted to mention briefly topics, and if any of you are interested, you can, you can follow up. But uh, they've sought comment in the past few months on issues concerning wireless 911 call routing, the feasibility of including multimedia content in wireless emergency alert messages, um, they've looked at the false reports that occurred in Hawaii in particular because there was a, as Howard knows, there was a National Association of the Deaf meeting in Hawaii with many deaf people who were not properly alerted um, about that false alert. Uh, so they're still looking carefully at that and issue and had a public roundtable on May 15th on it. Um, they also issued recently a final report on uh, the nationwide test of the emergency alert system. Um, and all of these, the reason, again, I mentioned them, they all have disability impacts, so we're constantly watching this. And finally, um, I've mentioned in the past that the commission in October expanded the hearing aid compatibility rules. Uh, look forward in the next year or two to seeing better volume control on your cell phones. I, can, I imagine this is going to help every one of us, especially in loud places. If anybody, I was not, but if anybody was there last night, I would think you could use the volume control, um, stand, the new volume control standard and, and new volume control requirements. And um, March 30th, some of these rules are going to go into effect. So I just have one more thing. Okay. The red is not by accident. <laughs> Rocking the red. Congratulations, CAPS. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Next, we're going to be joined by Barbara Espen, who's also a Deputy Bureau Chief with CGB. Welcome. Thank you. Um, this is my first time at the uh, Consumer Advisory Committee, so I'm going to one, I'm going to be very brief, and two, I'm going to introduce myself to anyone who doesn't already know me. Um, I am the third Deputy Bureau Chief in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. This is my third time at the FCC. I previously served in the Common Carrier, uh, Wireline, Cable Services, Media and Enforcement Bureaus in a variety of different positions. My first time with CGB, and I am, uh, I oversee the uh, governmental affairs portion of CGB's work, and those duties are performed by our Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, known as IGA, and our Office of Native Affairs and Policy, known as ONAP. And ONAP is focused on matters of interest to tribal governments and entities. And the IAC, IHEA is focused on issues of interest to state and local governments. Uh, so what is IGA doing these days? Well, in addition to its um, ongoing activities as the Commission's principal liaison with state and local governments, IGA is currently assisting in the review and selection of members for its intergovernmental advisory committee known as the IAC. Uh, this is to fill 15 vacancies that were created when the IAC was expanded from 15 to 30 members to be more in line with the size of other advisory committees the commission has commissioned, and to fill three vacancies that came up at the expiration of terms of sitting members. So the mission of the IAC is to provide advice to the Commission on issues of concern to local and state governments that are within the jurisdiction of the FCC. ONAP, uh, in addition to its ongoing activities as the principal liaison with tribal governments and entities, is currently assisting in the review and selection of members for the newly reconstituted, reauthorized Native Nations Communications Task Force. This task force was originally known as the Native Nations Broadband Task Force, but the Commission recognized that its mandate had, goes beyond broadband, covers access to um, spectrum, can be used for various things, tribal radio, another big issue. 
So the mission of this task force is to make recommendations to the commission on communications related issues that affect tribal interests, including but not limited to broadband, that will enhance the commission's ability to carry out its statutory mission and engage in government to government consultation with tribal nations. So I, with that, as those are the big ticket items that we're working on right now. I will turn the uh, seat over to Howard. Thank you for joining us. And do they do like a punch card for all the bureaus you've been in? And then like you get something at the end once you? <laughs> yeah, booby prize. <laughs> Next we have joining us Howard Purnell, who's Chief of Web and Print Publishing Division of CGB, and he's gonna give us an update on some outreach activities. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks you all, I'm happy to be here. I'm feeling a bit sleep deprived, as I'm sure some of you are, uh, so good to know I'm not alone in that. Um, I am the Chief of the Web and Print Publishing Division in CGB, and our group develops and maintains consumer-focused content, uh, guides, uh, alerts, uh, things of that nature, uh, all of the content you would find on our hub, our consumer help center. Uh, and like I said, there you'll find our, our alerts. We've launching, we launched a new feature, uh, help center posts, which is a blog-like feature, but it uh, enables us to uh, keep track of uh, recent developments, new developments with just little, you know, little blurbs here and there, but to take note and to uh, indicate what kind of uh, relevance they have to consumers, to these, to the folks that we're serving. The uh, uh, the library uh, of our consumer, our consumer guide library is also to be found there. It's 160 documents that we curate ongoing, uh, and uh, that's pretty much the help center. I encourage you to take a look at it. Of course, our most common, uh, most commonly used, most popular page by far would be our uh, unwanted calls, our robocall suite. Uh, that alone accounts for something on the order of 100,000 page views a month. Uh, so people are uh, very interested in that and tracking that and we keep that current with all the recent developments that come along. Uh, a lot of our uh, attention lately has been uh, uh, developing uh, more translation services. So, for instance, we have, in addition to Spanish, which we've had for some time, we've added four Asian American languages, and uh, with the hurricane season upon us, we're also now exploring uh, languages that are more commonly spoken down in the Gulf region. So we're working with our translation service on looking at uh, French for the Creole population, uh, uh, the uh, keeping some of the AAPI languages down there, but just expanding it to, to meet those needs. Uh, we also work with the Incentive Auctions Task Force to create uh, and support uh, with, with create consumer education during this transition period. And uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? That's, that pretty much covers it. Uh, we're, we're a busy team. Uh, it's a small team. There's a couple editors, a couple designers, uh, but we're pretty efficient and we uh, like to move quickly. So with that, okay, thank you. I think that pretty much covers it. Short and sweet. Thank you, guys. If, if anybody has questions for... Happy to take any. Go ahead, Rick. All right. Two questions for me, husband. Um, what what's the time frame expect? What is the time frame expected on the um, recruitment for the IAC for having the new members in place and ready to operate? And the second question: um, Why was the IAC put on hold rather than continuing normal operations while the new members were recruited? Well, I'm glad you asked those questions. I had meant to say that we expect to be um, moving ahead with the uh, expanded IAC uh, shortly. So um, it's been a, taken some time, but um, that's just the way the process works out. Um, so I'd say stay tuned to this channel. It won't. It shouldn't be too much longer. 
And with respect to your other question, um, once the IAC was expanded to 30 members, um, there were only 12 members remaining from the original 15 after the two terms expired and Mayor Lee passed away. So it um, didn't have a quorum, I believe. But it's really many factors have gone into the um, passage of time. So, all right. Any questions on the phone line for CGB staff? Nope. Steve? You mentioned, someone mentioned hurricane season coming up, and I'm just wondering from a consumer perspective, after last year's pretty bad hurricane season, are there lessons learned from that that you're going to be applying as we move into a new season, anything you're doing differently, or things that were particularly successful from a consumer perspective? Well, as I mentioned, uh, and thanks for the question, we, uh, we took a look at, you know, with this new translation service we've been offering, uh, we saw the need to expand that for uh, the Gulf region uh, this hurricane season. So we're working with, well, we're, we're, we've been working with our translation service to determine, you know, what would be the best uh, languages to focus on, uh, and then, uh, Get out, get the outreach materials, the messaging out there in those in those languages. So, in addition to uh, Korean and Vietnamese and Chinese uh, and Tagalog, which would be our Asian languages, uh, we are looking at uh, we are looking at French, Creole. Uh, we are looking uh, at others as well, in leaning on the translation services expertise. But it's pretty clear that. Uh, you know, initially when we started this service, we just, we picked those, the four Asian American languages uh, just really to get started. But, uh, you know, it's, we need to take a more regional approach and the hurricane season is, is, a, is like a prime example of why we need to do that. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing in that department. Uh, Karen, did you have anything to add? So as, as I mentioned, uh, the disability division or office is in constant, uh, constantly working um, in coordination with the Public Safety Bureau. We're also work, work, uh, we work regularly with FEMA. Um, but one of the things that's come up is the need for access at emergency shelters. And so in one of the items that was adopted just recently, we're going to try to make it a little bit easier for anyone to get access to relay services at emergency ser at emergency shelters. Um, we may have to do some more policy work on that as well, but making sure that people with disabilities have access at these shelters is really important, and it's something that unfortunately um, was not always the case in the past. Uh, Olivia? Hello. Hi. Uh, quick question. Um, in your dis consumer disaster relief uh, section of materials, do you feature the Lifeline program? That's one of those products that could really help low-income families uh, it, it connect to communi essential communications as they're uh, rebuilding their lives. So we do, we do include uh, our Lifeline materials as, as, as part of the package. Uh, the, uh, in terms of the, uh, the connection to uh, disaster or storms, the Gulf Coast, that, that's, a, that's a good idea. It's something that frankly hadn't, hadn't uh, occurred to me recently, but so we can, we can take a look at that. To, I mean, we, we, we have those materials. Yes. I think it's just a question of better integration with the package that we're thinking of for the Gulf. And, and I just want to, this is Karen, I just want to reiterate that we also still, I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, we have launched an, an American Sign Language um, library, video library. So we now have, I, I, I can't, I don't know the exact number, but 10 to 20 videos that are posted on the FCC's YouTube site, as well as the FCC's own website, yeah. that provide a host of information in American Sign Language. And 
maybe we, I don't know that we have something on Lifeline. But maybe we could add something to that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions on the phone in the room? Before you guys leave, I just want to say thank you. Uh, you've been very helpful and very supportive of the CAC in getting our agenda together, and it's always a pleasure to work with everybody on the CGB team. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a few minutes before our next speakers are scheduled to start at 10, so stay close and we'll get rolling once they're here. Okay, I think we're going to get back yep. underway here. Um, so next on the agenda, we're having a, we're going to have a presentation on what's ahead in 5G and other spectrum band uses. I think you heard the chairman mention um, and some CGB staff mention that a number of items were on yesterday's open meeting agenda, so this is a, a very timely topic, and we're very happy to be joined by Becky Schwartz and Jonathan Campbell who are legal advisors in the Office of the Bureau Chief with the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. So, Jonathan and Becky. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to be talking again about what's ahead in 5G and other spectrum bands, but uh, we weren't here for the beginning of the meeting and we weren't sure that this was covered, but just as a matter of reflection, uh, I think Becky would want me to mention this, uh, C-A-P-S, caps, caps, caps. <laughs> <laughs> So the FCC's approach to spectrum policy is based on a proven three-part formula. Uh, it's to make more spectrum available for both licensed and unlicensed use, uh, adopt flexible, technology-neutral, light-touch rules, uh, and remove unnecessary regulatory burdens and stay out of the way of technological development and details of implementation. In 2018, we're going to be continuing to apply this approach to a variety of bands, including low, mid, and high frequency spectrum, uh, available for flexible use, each of which has the potential to unlock innovation and new consumer-centric applications. These spectrum bands, including, uh, are going to be building upon 5G's proven data rates, connectivity, and reliability, uh, and will drive new use cases across uh, vertical markets, such as automotive, energy, food and agriculture, uh, city management and government, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, and transportation, and, and really so much more. Uh, we're going to be discussing a few of the major proceedings that are, that are currently ongoing uh, here at the commission, uh, and we're going to break them out by frequency range. I'm going to be uh, singing the bass part of this duet. Uh, I'm going to be dealing with low frequency spectrum. So low frequency spectrum. Um, as many of you know, is, is characterized by its wide area of propagation, its ability, ability to penetrate through clutter, and to, uh, to really make its way into buildings. Uh, and so last year, the FCC continued its efforts to focus on low band frequency spectrum by uh, wrapping up the broadcast incentive auction, uh, a first of its kind, two-sided spectrum auction that repurposed 84 megahertz uh, of, of this low band spectrum in the 600 megahertz band. Uh, from broadcast television uh, to flexible wire wireless use licenses. Um, the auction formally closed um, just over a year ago on uh, April 13th, 2017, uh, and it, that began the 39-month post-auction transition, uh, or the repack process as we call it, to clear the 600 megahertz spectrum ban, uh, basically to move the television stations uh, to their designated landing spots uh, and free up the band for the, uh, those folks who bought the uh, wireless licenses at auction. So the first of the 10 transition phases uh, ends on November 30th, 2018, uh, and the final phase ends, uh, is projected to end in, in July 3rd, 2020. Uh, the commission is in the process of reviewing uh, those applications for the licenses from those who, who bought them at the auction. Uh, we are well on our way uh, to wrapping that up. We have actually granted over 90% of the, the licenses uh, that were bought at auction, so there's just only a, a handful that remain. 
And licensees uh, have already begun deploying in some areas uh, in the 600 megahertz band where they won't interfere with the broadcast stations that have yet to be relocated. Um, and as the transition uh, proceeds, uh, they will be able to deploy even more advanced wireless services, uh, including 5G, on a, on a much more widespread basis. And so this is uh, very much an ongoing effort, but uh, things are very much on track. Um, and so with that, that's uh, what we've been focusing on in, in the low uh, frequency range. And I'm going to turn it over to Becky to discuss a little bit more about the mid frequency and the uh, high frequency, or the I guess the alto and the soprano. <laughs> yeah. Um, thanks, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. And I want to apologize because I am under the weather. So if I'm sniffling or a little stuffed up and hard to understand, I apologize. But like Jonathan said, I'm going to talk about mid-band spectrum and then um, high-band spectrum. So as you're probably aware, there's a lot going on in the commission these days in those, in those ranges. Um, mid-band spectrum goes all the way up to 24 gigahertz, but the commission has been focusing on um, the 3.5 gigahertz band and 3.7 to 4.2 and 6 gigahertz in its, um, in its rulemaking proceedings. So we have re um, released rules in the 3.5 gigahertz band, and uh, this is a very exciting band because we are approach approaching licensing in a different way with a um, spectrum access system coordinator who will be helping to manage a different type of licensing scheme with traditional licenses and um, something called general authorized access, which is similar to um, unlicensed, although legally it's something called licensed by rule. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts. So we're, we're focusing on getting the rules right. There's an NPRM pending right now. And then we are also uh, focusing on certifying equipment in the band, as well as moving along the approval process for the spectrum access systems that I mentioned, which are basically mm -hmm. highly automated frequency coordinators to make sure that everyone can use this band without interfering with each other. Um, so that's, that's what's going on right now in, in 3.5. Um, 3.7 to 4.2 and 6 gigahertz um, has been addressed most recently with a notice of inquiry that the commission released last August seeking comment on how we could use this band more eff effectively. The 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band has been traditionally used by satellite services but according to the record, it's not the most efficient use and there's room to use it for more flexible wireless services. So the commission's looking into that and um, we've received a lot of comments on the records from various stakeholders. So we're in the process of taking those into account and the chairman recently announced that we will be voting on a proposal uh, for rules in this band at the July meeting. So um, look out for that. And um, while most of the commenters did focus on the 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz band, um, we also saw a comment in the mid-band notice of inquiry on opening the 6 gigahertz band for greater unlicensed use um, or preserving the existing fixed service in that band. Some commenters um, advocated some other proposals for mid-band spectrums, such as licensed mobile use or point to multipoint. There's also widespread support for protecting the incumbents in the band from harmful interference. So we are, of course, looking into how to do that, but there's uh, various approaches on the record of how we might do that. Um, so that's what's going on in mid-band right now at the commission. I will move on to um, high-band frequencies, which is probably what is on everyone's mind because at yesterday's meeting we voted on the most recent uh, rulemaking in the spectrum frontier is proceeding. So um, that was that was adopted yesterday. And um, high frequency spectrum refers to spectrum above 24 gigahertz. It's also referred to as millimeter wave spectrum. And in the past, the spectrum hasn't been suitable for modal, mobile broadband because of its propagation characteristics. But advances in technology have made it possible that um, that carriers can now use this spectrum to pro to provide service. Using, um, using small cell applications. So that's really exciting and it will lead to, um, to low latency and very high speed services. Providers have already announced plans um, to launch 5G services using the millimeter wave spectrum in cities such as Sacramento, Los Angeles, Dallas, Waco, and South Bend, Indiana. 
So you have a variety of different geographies there. So I'll talk a little bit about the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding since, like I said, that was just uh, adopted yesterday. We continue to establish operational and licensing rules for this millimeter wave spectrum. This was the third report in order, so we're continuing to open up more bands. There was also a further notice of proposed rulemaking that is seeking comment on opening up another 2.75 gigahertz band, or 2.75 gigahertz uh, of spectrum in different bands. Um, but we've already adopted flexible wireless service rules for 12.55 um, gigahertz of millimeter wave spectrum across five different bands. So that's a lot of opportunities for different types of car carriers, and this is for both licensed and unlicensed use. The Commission has also adopted rules that maximize spectrum utilization in these bands by providing opportunities not only for terrestrial wireless services, but also for satellite services to grow. Um, and specifically, we've adopted rules for satellite services in rural areas. W yesterday's report and order specifically adopted a geographic performance metric, which is just one of um, a list of performance metrics that carriers can use to meet their build-out obligations, which is a different approach than the Commission has taken in the past, so we're hoping to um, provide opportunity for different types of services to grow. It also resolved pending um, sharing and operability in the 24 gigahertz band. It adopted a licensing plan for the lower 37 gigahertz band with um, 100 megahertz channels. It eliminated the pre-auction limit of 1,250 megahertz um, for millimeter wave spectrum bands that an, an entity can acquire at auction and instead Commission's going to do a case-by-case um, post-auction -case review of Spectrum Holdings. And as I mentioned, there was a further notice that's seeking comment on how we can open up even more Spectrum, including the 40 tot, 42 gigahertz band, which was one of the bands that was um, specifically tagged in the Mobile Now Act, which passed Congress a few months ago. Um, we've also looked at how we could expand limited um, fixed satellite service use in the 50.4 to 51.4 gigahertz band. And, you know, we're, we're moving forward not just by implementing rules, but we're going to start auctioning this spectrum so um, carriers can bid on it and it can go into the hands of consumers. And that will start in November of this year with the 24 gigahertz immediately, um, immediately followed by the 28 gigahertz band. So that wraps up what I have to tell you on mid and high band frequency. And we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mark. Hi, it was a very interesting presentation. And thank you very much because I think it's uh, very useful. I know zero, nothing, less than zero about spectrum, but I represent um, rural Appalachia. And my understanding of 5G generally is that it's going to be very fast access because you're going to have a lot more towers. There are probably many towers, but there's going to be a lot more towers around. Therefore, the distance between your phone and the tower is closer and your bandwidth is going to be greatly, greatly increased. But to wire the towers, you're going to need a lot more fiber. So representing a very rural area, my concern is that uh, 5G will not get out into the rural areas and it's going to just exasperate the problem we have with uh, rural areas not having the kind of access they need and people not wanting to live in rural areas because uh, the, the uh, more urban areas where there's more dense people where the access is so much better now in addition to you know having Fios and having uh, you know really good cable access they're going to have access to 5G and it's just going to create yet one more reason for people to to want to leave these rural areas so say something to me to make me feel that 5G will get to the rural areas, or um, you know, there, there's something that you're doing to, to consider uh, you know, rural America. Well, I would actually say, well, the, obviously providing service to rural areas is a, you know, a multi-part approach. So it's not just about the fiber, which is you know, the backhaul, and there are other ways of providing backhaul other than just fiber. I mean, there's, there's microwave and there's satellite use, but um, in terms of, I mean, one of the things that's so exciting about these mid and high band frequencies is it, the equipment is less expensive and smaller and 
probably easier to deploy in rural areas. And for example, in 3.5, the folks who are existing um, wireless broadband licensees are very interested in that spectrum and upgrading what the equipment that they currently have and the routers that they currently use to be compatible on 3.5. Um, I would also say the licensing structure is, is conducive to bringing uh, service to rural areas because there's much smaller license sizes, making it less expensive for the smaller carriers, carriers to be able to provide service. So I think it's a very exciting opportunity for rural areas. Thank you. Sure. Rick? mentioned that um, uh, the commission's approach is based on the uh, 5G's proven data rates and reliability and so forth. I was wondering, uh, is that proof based on the use of established 5G standards in actual practice or on something else? Um, well, I, I think that's, that's based on um, many of the uh, reports that the FCC has seen and some of the work that the, the Technology Advisory Committee has done and, and, and their look at 5G. Um, and so it's kind of a broad perspective that the SEC has on uh, the various different tests and, and uh, network architectures out there for 5G. Thaddeus. Um, maybe for Becky. Uh, I think Mark touched on part of my question, which is can you tell us a little more about the small uh, cell technology and how it fits into the current infrastructure and what the improvement might be? Oh, sure. I, I think that you'll see small cells being used, like I said, in the um, high frequency and even in the mid-frequency bands to provide new services because the, these are, um, like I said, low-latency, high-speed services, but at the higher waves, the um, spectrum doesn't travel as far, so you need smaller cells more closely spaced together to provide those services, but I think you'll also see some of the existing services improved by the use of small cells. So you'll see the you know, car carriers that want to supplement their service, provide faster service, get more folks on their network, also using those small cells to improve current services. Anybody on the phone have any questions? I'm a tagline from Benton. Is there a working definition of 5G? Is there a standard? Well, in, in 3GPP, they actually call it new radio or NR. Uh, but yeah, 5G, is, it's very broad. Uh, it's, it's really just referring to the new set of technologies and standards that are applying not just for your typical wireless broadband, but Internet of Things and vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications. And um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a very broad but exciting <laughs> term. It also stand for five games, which the Caps won in last night. <laughs> Very on point this morning. Um, <laughs> Single track mine here in DC. <laughs> Any other questions from the phone? Oh, so got to see. This is Irene, uh, and I want to piggyback on the rural. Um, is there anything other than making it available that's done? Uh, are being considered to really incentivize providers to do something so that we get fix this horrible inequity that we've got between rural and populated areas. So I, I think that question is probably broader than just what's happening in in 5G, and that's you know, something that the commission it's always a top priority for the chairman to expand access to rural areas and it's um, something we look at through our auction procedures and our universal service funding um, so yeah that's that's a very broad question and you know if you want to follow well I guess being somebody who lives in the area and have seen service options decline instead of in, and cost go up um, and and uh, knowing how many people do not have access, cannot get access, it, it uh, seems to me to be a pressing issue that we need to really address. And I I don't have any sense that we're to a point of really taking it on and 
and trying to do something. Well, um, I mean, I can tell you that we appreciate those concerns, and it is something that's always at the forefront of the commission's mind. And like I said, that's a you know a commission-wide goal that touches beyond just uh, what we're doing in specific frequency bands. And yeah, I'd be happy to follow up with you more offline uh, about some of the other programs that the commission is leading to try and address concerns in rural areas. And there are probably folks who you know, work in our universal service funding and that's you know, in a, actually another bureau than um, Jonathan and I work in who could give you more detailed information. Thank you. Sure. Steve. So beyond the spectrum issues, I know the Bureau is also working on, um, you have your infrastructure proceeding looking at state and local um, regulation of deployment. Can you talk a little bit about where that stands and what you think the timing might be for moving forward? Sure. Um, so work is very much still underway on that. Um, as some folks might know in this room, there was a, <clears throat> an NPRM and an NOI um, released, I, I think, a, about a year ago. Um, and uh, there has been action within that NPRM and NOI with some recent orders touching on uh, historic preservation and uh, NEPA, the environmental review processes. But there's still some outstanding questions from the NPRM and the NOI that our uh, competition and infrastructure uh, policy division is, is still thinking through and still working on. Um, so I think that's still on the forefront of their mind and, and they're, they're uh, really grinding away on some of those questions. And so um, we're optimistic that there'll be action soon, but really no uh, harder, fast uh, deadline there. One of the things that you mentioned was uh, incumbents and ensuring that things sort of cooperate and coexist where there are incumbents. Can you talk a little bit about who's, who or what some of those incumbents are? Um. Oh, sure. Uh, well, in the mid-band spectrum, in 3.5 gigahertz, it was, that band was primarily used by the Department of Defense for Naval Radar Systems. So the FCC has worked very closely with NTIA and DOD on how to protect those radars. but. Since it's the Navy, you know, most of them are um, operated on the coastline, so it was a great opportunity to be able to provide services inland, um, and that's been a really collaborative process. And there were some um, some commercial services in the band. I, th I think I mentioned the um, the wireless broadband licensees that had nationwide licenses that will be eventually operating under the 3.5 gigahertz rules, um, and a lot of them are in rural areas, so. That's an exciting opportunity. Um, in 3.7 to 4.2, it's used by satellite operators primarily. Um, so we're looking at a lot of proposals, including proposals from the satellite guys on um, how we can use that band more effectively and make room for flexible wireless use. And Spectrum Frontiers is, that is, covers a wide variety of bands. So there are a wide variety of incumbents, including um, both private industry and again satellite and then um, also the federal government so again we're working very closely with NTIA on um, cooperation mechanisms any other questions on the phone All right. thank you both for your time yeah. today we really appreciate you joining us thank you thank, thank you for you. having us and I'm sure that this will be an evolving topic oh, yeah. in, in, the, in the coming weeks, months, and, and, and year, and we'll probably look forward to maybe having a revisit with some further updates down the road. Sounds like that. that. Yeah, thanks very much. So we have a break scheduled next. Um, so we'll go ahead and start that early and uh, be back by 10.50. Thank you, everyone. start to get people back it's, around. Shirley says, I'll get out my hook. <laughs> That's right. It's classic Shirley. That's right. Welcome back, everyone. So next on the agenda, uh, we have a topic that some consumers in different parts of the country are just now starting to experience. A couple have already gone through it. 
Um, and it's something that will be growing um, as, the, as the phases roll out over the next few years, more, more stations will be moving. So we're talking about the, the broadca broadcast repack. Um, we're gonna start off with a presentation on the mapping tool, and then we're gonna move to a panel discussion with a few stations and participants from those stations who have already made their transition. So I'm very pleased to be joined by Jean Cadu, who is the chair the chair of the FCC Incentive Auction Task Force, and Charlie Mench, who's been with us before. Many of you remember him and is on Gene's team. So, right. yeah, chair, chair, chair is correct because we already have a chairman and, and we've had chairwomen, and that's a special <laughs> role at the commission, which they didn't want to give me, which is fine. <laughs> which is fine. Yeah, right. So, I thank mean, there's you. future. <laughs> thank, thank you, uh, Ed, and, and thanks to the committee for inviting us to update you on the post auction uh, broadcast transition. Uh, the transition is in full swing, believe it or not. It's been a year since the auction closed. And consumers in a number of markets, as Ed said, are already seeing changes in their channel lineup. Uh, to date, over 70 stations have moved to new channels, most of them via sharing arrangements with other channels in their markets. And the commission has granted uh, over 65 requests from stations to move earlier in the schedule than they were otherwise planned. And a few of those moves have already occurred. Um, I was here during the last session and uh, listened to the, the, the caller who was concerned about rural broadband deployment. And I have good news. Uh, and that is that um, in the 600 megahertz band that we auctioned in the incentive auction, the early moves and channel sharing and vacation of channels by uh, existing uh, winners in the auction um, have, have led to the clearing of 600 megahertz spectrum much faster, I think, than anyone anticipated. We all sort of assumed at the beginning of the process that it would be at least three years during the transition before anybody could deploy anything on 600 megahertz. And uh, if you've read the press lately, you've seen a lot of uh, John Ledger uh, videos and uh, announcements about at least T-Mobile has said that they are already deploying 600 megahertz in a lot of cities, including importantly in rural areas. So that's a good thing, and uh, we're hoping that other, other uh, licensees are gonna be doing the same thing. So the early moves have been very instructive um, of stations uh, as we prepare for the first transition phase. Um, phase one, which is the first big formal phase of transitions, uh, will begin in September and conclude on November 30th when all of the stations in phase one must be off their pre-auction channel. And I think that there are probably 100, over 100 stations in sure. phase one yeah. who are going to be moving in that transition period. So that's the first really big chunk of mm -hmm. stations. Um, you'll hear from uh, our, our panelists in a few minutes uh, we've been working with broadcast stations and the National Association of Broadcasters to raise awareness of the coming channel changes. Uh, in a minute, Charlie Meisch will tell you about some of our FCC resources. Uh, NAB also has an informative plan to rescan effort underway and a website with lots of information at tvanswers.org. Uh, we're very pleased with the progress in this regard, but recognize we're going to need to expand the resources available to consumers and viewers with technical issues, who have problems with technical issues as they attempt to rescan their TV tuners to continue to receiving over the air free TV. So the good news is that in April, Congress enabled us to expand our efforts by appropriating $50 million to bolster our existing consumer education efforts. The Incentive Auction Task Force is working with the FCC's Consumer and Government Affairs Bureau to develop proposals to enhance our call center and our outreach capabilities, and we are interested in hearing feedback from this committee and other stakeholders to ensure a smooth transition and adequate consumer education. So before we turn to our panel, uh, here's Charlie Meisch, who is our Task Force Senior Advisor for Policy and Communications. Uh, to update you on some of the new and updated resources that the Commission has developed. Thanks, Gene. Um, as Ed mentioned, I'm a, uh, a repeat guest uh, here at the CAC, so thanks for having me back. Uh, since our, uh, our last briefing, uh, we've added three new consumer resources uh, to the complement of, or to complement our existing battery of consumer guides, FAQs, and PSAs that I had uh, uh, displayed to you previously. 
Uh, and you'll recall we updated many of those materials to reflect the impact of the auction and the importance of rescanning um, during the transition. Uh, first, in response to a re request we had from this committee, uh, I'm happy to report that we now have a video explaining the transition and the importance of rescanning uh, in American Sign Language. Uh, that video is now available today on the FCC's YouTube page, and uh, in the coming days we'll be embedding that in, in uh, other sites uh, here. Uh, and you know it's certainly available for other organizations to uh, link to or embed in their sites as well. So I'll make sure that uh, the committee has that uh, URL and you can use that as, as needed. Uh, secondly, we've uh, collaborated with NAB on a co-branded, consumer-focused one-pager uh, explaining the transition, advising viewers to rescan their TVs, and directing them to resources available at, uh, at tvanswers.org, uh, NAB's site that Gene just mentioned. Uh, and uh, the great news here is the document's available in nine different languages in addition to English, uh, including Spanish, Vietnamese, Chinese, Tagalog, and Arabic. Uh, and finally, this spring, we updated our DTV reception map, which uh, many of you will remember was a very, very important consumer tool during the DTV transition a decade ago. Uh, the updates reflect the outcomes of the auction and uh, let viewers know about changes that have occurred or will occur. And now I'm going to play musical chairs and walk down to the computer, and I'll give you a quick uh, test drive. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Multimedia. Interactive, I dare say. Okay, so. Uh, so the, to, reach the, uh, to reach the map, very simple URL, uh, FCC.gov slash DTV map. And here we are. We've got, uh, now the map has the same uh, consumer disclaimer that uh, it had before uh, advising that the signal strength information that you'll see when you put in information uh, will uh, you may vary. It's based on uh, having a, an aerial antenna on your roof, basically. Uh, so your mileage may vary, as they say. And we also talk a little bit about uh, you know, the incentive auction itself and the fact that there'll be there's new information on the site. Uh, explaining what the, what the outcomes uh, are and how that may affect consumers. So um, you can enter your location, and I'm going to enter our current location. And there we are. Uh, and what you see, so we've got uh, the map here, and you can, of course, zoom in, but uh, for the purposes of illustrating what the map will show, I'll keep us at this view. And to the left, you'll see uh, the signal strength legend of the different uh, stations that are available from this location. Uh, all these stations in green are stronger signals, and as we get further out, you can see some Baltimore and other Maryland stations out here, sort of in the yellow and orange areas. Um, you'll also notice uh, that there's a uh, extra column on the, uh, on the legend here that uh, says IA for incentive auction. Um, and so for each of these stations, um, again, you can, if you click on the call sign, you'll get the, you know, the facility ID, location, what, uh, what RF channel they broadcast on, and their strength, which a lot of consumers would not be looking for. Uh, and then on the map, you can see uh, the location of the tower relative to where we are. But let's look at uh, s some specific examples related to the auction. Um, so you see this first set of stations here. Uh, you see two call signs associated with the same tower. Uh, this is an implemented channel sharing agreement, which means that uh, these two stations are now sharing a facility and, a, and an RF channel. Uh, you see they're both broadcasting from channel 15. Uh, so, and again, you can see that this, you, can, you should be able to receive both channels and you should receive them at uh, reasonable strength all the way from uh, American University. Now, you notice also that there's nothing in the legend here because at this point, uh, the impact of the auction isn't really the most important thing the consumer would wanna, would wanna know. They're gonna wanna know that these two stations are on the same channel. So let's look at uh, something with information in this, uh, uh, the IA column. So here you see R, and if you hover over that, uh, you can see that the station is going to be repacked. And 
you can also see that they've already implemented a channel sharing agreement. So if we click on this, uh, in addition to the other information I highlighted uh, above, you can see their current RF channel, the channel to which they'll be repacked, channel 34, uh, the fact that they're sharing, and very importantly, the, uh, the repacking dates. In other words, uh, which, what, which phase are they in? Now, consumers won't care if it's phase one or phase 10. What they really want to know is, what are the dates during which I need to worry about rescanning my television? Uh, now, this would be important if, uh, if a consumer didn't get the memo, so to speak, on the coming transition uh, and went to this site, they could see, oh, uh, NBC actually was being repacked, and if it's, let's say that it's, uh, you know, April or August 3rd of next year, and suddenly you couldn't find uh, your local NBC set ch ch station, you could see that they were repacked during this period, uh, and that rescanning would be helpful. Uh, here's another station, WDCA, uh, which has OS. Now, this says that the uh, station was uh, planning to go off the air as a result of the auction, but intends to share their facilities with another station. And this is, in fact, the case. Uh, WDCA has a channel sharing agreement. Uh, the application has been granted. Uh, they are scheduled to move no later than July 23rd of this year. Uh, so if you were to come back uh, sometime in August, you would see that uh, they would be, <laughs> they've implemented this agreement. You wouldn't see OS next to it anymore. You would just see uh, uh, the, their channel sharing partner, which I believe is WTTG. Um, let's look at another station just for illustrative purposes. Um, this station, WNUV, uh, out of Baltimore, uh, some, uh, some DC residents will probably likely be able to get this station. Uh, they have a different uh, repacking date. Uh, they are going, and I think that's phase nine, uh, early 2020. Uh, so you can see that uh, as, a, as a viewer, you'd be able to look at all the stations available to you in your market uh, from your location and see which stations are moving and when, different phases, et cetera. So uh, if you need to plan to rescan, you can plan for all the stations if you want to just by going to this, to this page. Um, the, uh, the, the page also has a go to my location uh, button that I tried to use earlier, and apparently this IP, the IP address for this room is, is in New York. So, <laughs> so I'm going to take a closer look at that function. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and I know we're on Wi-Fi. I don't know if that makes a difference, but uh, we're going to take a, a closer look at that. But certainly entering your address or your zip code, you can get very detailed information mm -hmm. about all the stations uh, changing in your, in your area. So um, I don't know, Ed, if this is a good time to take questions or if we want to save that for the... Yeah, I guess are there any questions about the, the mapping cool. tool yeah. um, or other resources, and then we'll turn to our panelists. Hearing none? Um, just real quick, and does anyone on the phone have any questions? Okay, um, for those of you who are on the phone who are not participating on the panel that's about to start, please mute your lines to make it easier to understand the speakers who will be doing presentations. Not using the mic, sorry. Uh, just a quick question. I'm looking at this on my smartphone. And going under each of the stations that I have that provide some really good information about the date, the repack date, uh, but it uses some information that uh, I'm not clear about. So how do you get information that it refers to? Um, is there some way it, it doesn't, it's not, you know, you can't click on to say, oh, what does it mean to say, you know, when it says sharing intention, for example? How do you get that definition of what that means? Sure. Uh, I actually got, we, we got some feedback uh, from, from uh, doing some focus groups on this, on updating the language to kind of include more like, you know, here's your rescan period or that sort of thing. So. Uh, Certainly, if there's, we, we tried to keep the jargon down, but this is also a technical map as well, is, historically. So we've got a lot of information that um, that I think typically engineers would look at as well. So uh, we're trying to find the sweet spot on on the rhetoric. If there's a if a glossary would be helpful, 
uh, I think we can we can insert that and have it sort of be static on the page so that people can see it. Yeah, and I, I agree. You don't want to put too much on the page, right. but if you yeah. can click onto it mm -hmm. and have That's it go good. someplace where yeah. you could get that information, I think that would be helpful. Excellent. That's, idea. Yeah, great idea and very, very easy to do. So I'll take that back. Okay. Well, so let's turn to our, our panel. Um, we're lucky uh, and fortunate to have representatives from two stations uh, that have already transitioned to their new channels with us today to talk about their on-the-ground experience, uh, and in particular to give you a sense of, of the viewer and consumer issues that, uh, that, that they experienced. Uh, here with us today is Bowden Zachary, who is the general manager of uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin PBS stations WMVS and WMVT, who led uh, those stations for January transition. And on the phone, we have Dave Booth, who is vice president and general manager of WX. OW in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Brady Kreisler, who's the Corporate Director of Engineering at Quincy Media, Inc., uh, who both led that station's uh, recent transmission, transition in May. Uh, Bowden and Dave uh, and, and, and Brady will give us a brief overview of their experience. Um, then we'll hopefully have some time for, for questions. Uh, let's start, Bowden, with, with you. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, we called our campaign plan to scan. So I have some visuals for you and a narrative that sort of follows it. Uh, good morning, my name's Bodan Zachary. I'm the general manager of Milwaukee PBS. Our station is a member, proud one, of PBS. And of our estimated 600,000 plus monthly viewers, most of them aged 50 and over, about 38,000 are members. This is gonna be an important point. Uh, Milwaukee PBS, is uh, a licensee of Milwaukee Area Technical College. The Board of Directors voted to relinquish the Channel 36 WMVT bandwidth in the FCC Spectrum auction with a plan to channel share on WMVS, which is Channel 10. Um, our station has 65 full-time staff. We produce six local news and public affairs shows all of which participated in messaging the channel share, scan, rescan your remote. And in our market, more than 20% 20, 20 of our viewers uh, watch us over the air. So uh, with a target date of January 8th, 2018, to begin channel sharing, Milwaukee PBS launched its all hands on deck campaign in October of 2017. We created a plan that would take advantage not only of our own air and online, but also our deep involvement in the many communities we serve throughout 11 counties in southeast Wisconsin. This is where public television differs from commercial broadcasters. And so you know, even though I'm biased to PBS, I enjoyed a 20-year career in commercial broadcasting and cable before joining PBS in 1997. Milwaukee PBS interacts with its members on a daily basis, whether that's through calls to our membership or volunteer areas with questions about the broadcast schedule, a call about my monthly magazine didn't show up, or questions about a thank you gift somebody may, is, is supposed to receive through our fundraising drives called pledge drives. So we average at least one live community event a month, which also played into Plan to Scan. We publish a monthly magazine that goes to 38,000 of our viewers, and my direct phone line and email are always listed, and I definitely hear from viewers all the time. So as you can see in this, um, we created spots featuring the hosts of each of our shows. One of them is a Spanish language news and public affairs show. That spot was in Spanish. Um, I'm in a spot that you'll also see where we announced that on January 8th, we would be live uh, in our studios uh, on phone banks so that people could call in with questions as they were trying to um, go into this scanning uh, or rescanning of their remotes. Uh, we exceeded the FCC requirements. Um, better that than be sorry about uh, the customer pushback after that, and we began crawls heavily on January 1st of 2018 and continue through January 8th uh, saying we're about to channel share. So this was the graphic we used 
in all our uh, campaign. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the graphic we put in everywhere to show that um, on January 8th, this was going to be the new lineup and that uh, because of shrinking of our bandwidth, we would be losing the traffic channel. We have since been able to squeeze the traffic channel images onto our weather, uh, which is a big deal. This was a flyer that we gave out at all of our events in the communities. Um, this is one of our hosts, Portia Young, uh, who, did a, who hosts a show called 1036. And you'll see her in, in the spot after my presentation. This is the kind of crawl that we ran on January 8th. So we opted to go at 9 AM on January 8th. Two local uh, commercial broadcasters, CBS and Sinclair, opted to go at 5 AM because they wanted to use their, 5 a, their morning newscast to say, we're, ch we're changing today. Um, interesting note is that they came to us in November saying, hey, can we piggyback with you to do an announcement that all three of us are changing? And on January 8th, this was my team. We kept our phone banks from the pledge drive. We had spent months training our staff and the guy standing, our, our two chief engineers. Everybody had been trained on remotes. We all had resources on our laptops that you could click on to take you to a manufacturer's website so you could see the remote and ask somebody, what do you have? And the irony is, here we are live. We started at 9 AM. We went to 10 PM. And the calls were so overwhelming that I said, let's do this again. The next day, we did another six hours. That's one of our head engineer who also was on the phone. And the irony is, is that on the morning of, the commercial broadcasters were so overwhelmed and had no staff that they were giving out and crawling our phone number to call for help. So that's the bulk of my presentation. That's where you can reach me. Um, I didn't have a chance. We just updated. Uh, if you go to milwaukeepbs.org forward slash plan to scan, all one word, we posted all the eight spots that we ran ad infinitum. Uh, to show you the breadth of what we did. So with that, I will show you two spots. The first one is me, only because you see me in front of the a phone bank. And it was important that people became accustomed to the fact that they would know they could talk to us. Hello, I'm Bodan Zachary. On January 8th at 9 a.m., Milwaukee PBS will begin a new channel lineup. Viewers watching on cable or satellite TV will not need to do anything. But if you watch television using an over-the-air antenna, some of your channels will be effective. You will need to take your remote, one of these, and you will need to do a channel scan. Doing a channel scan should be easy, but if you do have problems or know someone who needs help, we'll have a special phone bank open, staffed by Milwaukee PBS employees on January 8th, beginning at 9 a.m., to help answer your questions. And you can also find more information right now by visiting milwaukeepbs.org. Remember, if you watch television using an over-the-air antenna, on Monday, January 8th, you'll need to do a channel scan. And on the same day, starting at 9 a.m., we'll have a special hotline open to help with your channel scan questions. Thank you. Hi, I'm Portia Young. On January 8th, Milwaukee PBS will be realigning some of our channel positions. If you watch on cable, you will not experience any changes. But if you watch TV using an over-the-air antenna, some of your channels will be affected. So, on January 8th, anyone watching TV using an antenna needs to grab their remote and do a channel scan. Remember, January 8th, plan to scan. For more information, visit MilwaukeePBS.org. If I could give you closing uh, results so you understand. Uh, on January 8th and 9th, uh, we had a total of 589 calls, which breaks down to 42 calls an hour over the 14 hours we ran the phone bank. Some of the calls lasted as long as one hour. 
Uh, in addition to the phone banks that you saw, we have, a, we have a volunteer who's been with us since 1983. He proudly reminds me. And he is in volunteer services five days a week, eight hours a day, taking calls from viewers uh, on any number of issues. And Christopher told me that uh, he received uh, 211 calls. He answered 121 emails for a total of 332 transactions. There was an uptick in May of calls to viewer services because we have snowbirds who were returning from Florida and other warm areas coming back to Milwaukee for the summer. So, uh, so he, he's been getting an avalanche of calls again. Uh, takeaway problem is third party listing services. We did not anticipate the kinds of problems we would have. Uh, I encourage everybody to think about it because our listing services were messed up forever. Um, and one last thing that was interesting is following all the FCC required notifications, certified everything down to the letter, I still got a call from a certain major cable provider who was outraged that she didn't know anything about any of this. And in 30 seconds, we pulled out our file and had the certified registered receipt and faxed it over immediately and not an apology for the fact that we were right and she was wrong. So um, just one little takeaway that I thought was interesting. And as I said, if you go to milwaukeepbs.org uh, slash plan to scan, you can see all of the different spots we did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, that was really, really helpful. Um, I'm hoping that we have uh, uh, Dave Booth and Brady Kreisler on the phone. Uh, are you there, guys? He thought you were. Yeah. Can you hear us? Yes. Now we can. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're both here. So if you guys want to do your presentation, then we'll do some questions. You bet. Well, my name is uh, Dave Booth. I'm the Vice President and General Manager of WXOW TV in La Crosse. So our first presenter was from the east coast of Wisconsin. We are from the west coast of Wisconsin. Um, La Crosse-Eau Claire is the 129th market. WXOW serves approximately 60% of the population in this market and is licensed to La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is located in the southern half of the La Crosse-Eau Claire DMA. The remainder of the DMA is served by our satellite station, WQOW, which is located in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and serves the northern portion of the market. WQOW will actually move channels within a couple of months. Um, there's two general elements, as I see it, to the preparation for a channel change, the technical side and the viewer side. My team uh, focused on the viewer side and was able to do that in part because of the outstanding leadership on the technical side of Brady Dreisler, Quincy's Corporate Director of Engineering. He assembled his team of general contractors, tower crews, and our on-site engineers, and that entire portion of the process went incredibly smoothly due to Brady's planning and ex execution. So what I'm going to do now, uh, if we could, if Ed, if we could go to the PowerPoint, I'm going to focus on the viewer side, and then I'll uh, give Brady a little bit to talk about the technical side. So Ed, since I can't see it, can you let me know when the PowerPoint is up? We're, we're good to go. Okay. Uh, we were doing a frequency change, and it was gonna, it's going to be a, it was a little more changing channels on a certain date. Uh, we were moving from RF channel 48 uh, to RF channel 28, and we were doing it on May 31st of 2018 at 11 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Um, so we did it. It's been roughly a week since we've made this change. Our authorized main on our new channel was going to be 251 kilowatts at a height above average terrain of 248 meters. The complicating factor for us was uh, we have to rebuild that. So we had to sign off channel 48 and then sign on channel 28, and obviously we can't do that uh, on the old antenna. So we have a special temporary authority for the first uh, probably 6 to 12 weeks of operating on a side-mounted a lower power antenna with an ERP of uh, about 97 kilowatts and about uh, 14 meters lower than our normal uh, height 
and also side mounted so we do have a shadow behind our tower that some that is going to affect some viewers we also had another factor since we have people on the tower and we have equipment on the tower there are times that we have to go even lower power and reduce it from 97 kilowatts down to about 10 kilowatts uh, ERP just for the safety of the workers and not to interfere with the gin pole equipment that's on the antenna so uh, some people were going to occasionally lose us even if they successfully got us after rescan if we go to the next page Ed um, I'm just showing the contour maps uh, of the authorized main versus our STA coverage the STA coverage on here um, in some spots turned out to be a little generous uh, it wasn't quite that good um, and then obviously when we were going down to 10 percent power on our STA it was dramatically smaller than that um, but it, it was a good guide to help us know where we were going to have issues which was in the far southern cities and mostly the far eastern cities on the next page Ed anticipated issues things we knew were going to happen ahead of time uh, we knew we were already dealing with a population where 20 percent receive all of their television via an antenna that's obviously higher than the national average so it, this was a big deal in this market we were the first state we are the first station in the market to change frequencies and the only station doing it on the date so we knew all the responsibility fell on us to get the word out to people to rescan um, at our initial frequency change we'd be operating on an STA as I mentioned with reduced height reduced ERP and side mounted um, we knew that a portion of our viewers when they called in for help were not going to be successful getting our channel back until we were back to full power on our main and then during construction we knew there'd be times where STA power would be cut by 90 percent um, which would which if you can think through this people that had already found us on a rescan all of a sudden we magically disappear for a few hours a day and the one thing we didn't want to have happen is have those people panic and rescan again because while we were at reduced power they weren't going to find the channel and then when we did return to full STA power they were going to wonder what happened they wouldn't know that we returned so we had to really implore people that we would gonna we would be going to lower power temporarily it would only be a few hours at a time and not to rescan when that happened we mounted a incredibly aggressive communications plan on the next slide um, tvanswers.org that template was was incredibly helpful and we followed it pretty closely uh, we went way overboard like they did in Milwaukee with public service announcements. Uh, we actually, between our three stations and ABC, CW, and Decades, uh, ran about 1,800 ads over an eight-week schedule, combination of 30s and 15s. Uh, half of the spots were the TV answers, uh, pre-prepared spots, locally tagged, and the other half were locally produced ads featuring our local news anchors. We ran crawls for eight weeks. They started out every three hours. They eventually increased to every hour. Uh, which came to almost 1,800 crawls across the three stations in eight weeks. Our website was plastered with local stories from our news department, links to the TV Answers website, links to the TV Answers how-to video to do rescans. Uh, we plastered our Facebook and Twitter feeds with local stories, the same things with TV Answers. We sent out uh, SMS messages to our, our viewers. There, there were subscribers to our weather apps and our news apps. We sent letters to government officials, both elected and public safety, and we created a special phone line where people could call ahead of time and after the fact and hear instructions on how to rescan. And then if they were having problems, they could talk to a live technician or leave a message for a callback. Like I said, it's been just over seven days since we made the change. The technical change went as planned. We had a little bit of issues with overheating early on, but we got that quickly under control. Um, the pot, as I said before, we serve the southern half of the market, and we estimated that the household population was about 114,000. Twenty percent of them being OTA households put about 23,000 people impacted by this change. Uh, we received 220 phone calls, most of them in the first 48 hours. Um, a lot of them came to our rescan hotline. Uh, our news department, which, which we weren't prepared for, uh, got a lot of phone calls as well because that's the number of people know by heart. And so they had to help people, and our program director ended up getting uh, calls routed to her. Uh, we felt like we were really successful on the calls. About 80% of the people, and I probably personally talked to 40 or 50 people myself, uh, we would get uh, success with about 80% of people once we talked them through the rescan. Um, it was complicated by the fact that there's dozens of different TVs and remotes, and, and usually the population we were talking to was 60-plus um, and may not have been as familiar with their electronics 
um, as as they had, but they hadn't maybe rescanned in the past. So um, a lot of patience, a lot of answers. But we were real pleased that 80% of people uh, rescanned and found us. Um, 10% we figure just didn't have enough power, and we've taken their numbers and names, and we will be calling them back personally when we get to our full main power. And they were very pleased to know that we would let them know when they could find us again. Uh, 5% of them ended up turning to friends and neighbors, relatives to help with the rescan. Um, and then we had about 5% that we just uh, try as we may, couldn't fix it. And we've actually been sending people out to those homes. And so far we've made five or six home visits and been successful in all of them of getting people um, their TV channels back. So that's the end of my viewer end of it, if Brady wants to add anything from the technical side. Uh, I think uh, from a technical side, it did go well, but as we all know, hindsight is 2020. Um, I think this is something that everybody's going to struggle with, especially in the normal, normal northern climates, and that is that uh, weather plays a huge role in this. We really wanted to get started on our tower work four to five weeks earlier than we did. Well, the tower we had used, we've got some great vendors. They weren't ready because they were still struggling with weather uh, issues at a preceding site, and even if they had shown up, they would have not done anything uh, because they would have uh, been, been on the ground uh, waiting for the weather to clear. Um, and I think a lot of stations in the northern climates, even with my phase one stations that I have that won't go on until this fall, are going to start to struggle with that for that have complex projects uh, that will, uh, as we get closer to September and we're still doing tower work in the northern climates, that's going to be a problem and it will cause delays. Um, as you know, before we uh, made this switch, we had the transmitter on the air in a test environment. Uh, which everybody, I think, has the authority to do. Uh, in hindsight, I think that we would do differently. We did not put PSIP data into it, so therefore, if somebody did rescan early, they wouldn't pick it up. We wanted to test our re we wanted just wanted to uh, test our uh, RF systems and make sure they were working. In hindsight, that was probably a mistake. Having some early repacks, uh, people who scanned early, not that we would promote it that way, but uh, probably would not have harmed us and may have helped us, except that they would have had the station on in two different positions and that may have led to some confusion. So from a technical standpoint, weather seemed to be the 800-pound gorilla that seemed to uh, give us more challenges than anything else. Other than that, uh, we did learn quite a bit from this process. Great. Well, thank, thank you, Bowden, um, Dave, and uh, Brady. This is really uh, interesting and helpful. It, it, it helps to uh, inform us. We are trying very hard to keep up with stations who are moving early to get this kind of feedback to find out what what kinds of things work and what kinds of things might have been, might have been good to anticipate had you, had you had experience so that future stations are able to anticipate. I think what, what, what both of these stations experience show you is that it is very much in the station's interest to make sure that consumers and viewers have information that they need to be able to find the channels as quickly and easily as possible after a transition. They've all gone, every, every station we've talked to has gone extra miles to make sure that their viewers are educated and informed, even down to what, uh, what Dave was talking about and, and Brady with, with home visits. Uh, to help those last few remaining uh, consumers. So we view that as really positive and, and not totally, of course, it, it was predictable, right? I mean, it's important for stations to reach their viewers, and every station who is doing this is going to want to, to do that, and we're really pleased about that. So one of the things that we're kind of trying to do is kind of collect some best practices to help stations and reach out to stations who are going to, to go through this in the future uh, to help them. Um, Bowden, you mentioned something called listing services, and I'm not sure that everyone uh, understands what that was, but you said that, that was a concern. People who had TiVo started calling, going, what is going on? You know, everybody was pointing fingers at each other from, well, we didn't know, we don't know what to do with this, meaning TiVo. Um, our Tribune, you know, just anybody doing these listing services. Hopefully they're now understanding that this is part of what's going to be happening, but I think everybody has to be proactive on things. This is one thing we had not anticipated. Mm -hmm. I wish we had thought of that, but again, in hindsight. Yeah, you, you, you are, unfortunately, I don't want to call it the bleeding edge, but you're out in the forefront, yeah. and yeah. obviously there are going to be some of those things, and that's why we want to try to find out what those were from all of you um, to be able to help other stations and, and other organizations. Um, um, Dave, you mentioned that, that 
the, the fact that you're operating on an interim antenna while you're doing your tower work on your main antenna um, means that there's sort of times when you have to be at low power and, and other things. Um, how are you educating your viewers about those things so that they know that not to rescan too many times and lose you? Um, we've first of all told the people that have called about rescanning uh, that that may happen occasionally. So if you get us and then lose us, just be patient. We will come back. Um, that was the first step. The second step is we've done news stories telling people. And then whenever we're in a low power situation, we have a, a story that goes up on our um, um, on our website that tells people are having trouble getting us right now. Here's what's going on. Uh, we'll be returning to full power shortly. We really try to keep those reduced power times to the daytime, not during newscast, not during prime time. Um, thank you. Um, let me ask first if there's anybody in the room or on the phone who has questions. Yeah, yeah this is Steve with the uh, American Consumer Institute. I just, just to expand on the, the follow-up on, on the third-party listing services, so that includes the TV guides and, and, the, and what's published in the newspapers? Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes, yes. And, and, and ultimately, did you see a, a drop in viewership as a result of this, or, 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 or has lot, m most of that uh, been made back up uh, as people um, uh, rescanned? Um, I think our people stayed with us, um, understanding that there were snafus in the system, so they didn't give up. It was just frustrating for all of us, and, and uh, I, I, no, I didn't see any drop. Um, Bowden or, or Dave, you want to talk a little bit about the types of questions that consumers had when they called into your call centers? Sure. I'll, I'll just jump in, because this was uh, a lot of it had to do with um, people who had UHF antennas um, suddenly you know, that they installed 20 odd years ago, suddenly uh, I can't get on my rooftop anymore to do any physical changes. Um, so even though we're not in the, we're not Best Buy or a retailer, we did, you know, we, uh, we did have talking points, I don't have in front of me, but where we explained uh, how close are you to Milwaukee, how far are you from Milwaukee, so that the two recommended brands were either Leaf, um, if you were closer to us, or Clear Mac, uh, Clearstream Max 2, is it? Uh, which is more powerful and goes 50 miles and beyond. And so they were very grateful to that. In addition, there were two installers within our uh, area, obviously, you know, for pay. And, and they were charging, I think, $65 an hour. So we would tell people who said, mm -hmm. I can't do this. I, I'm physically not able to do what I could do before, um, that there were these services, and, and they were charging $65 an hour. So people did take advantage of that information. Interesting. As, as far as our market, um, we didn't have the, the thing we felt good about is People were not surprised. They, they had been well-educated that the rescan was coming. The, most of the issues they were having was not knowing how to rescan on their particular TV. Um, so it, it was a lot of uh, walking through the menus. Uh, one of the things I found personally helpful, I'd ask them what brand of TV they had, and then I would Google uh, a, an image of their remote control and say, okay, do you have the you know, Samsung with the three multicolored buttons on the bottom row? Okay, so then I was looking at their remote, and I could say, go to the left side of the remote, halfway down, press that button, labeled whatever, um, and then walk them through the process. So it was a lot of people just not knowing how to rescan. Um, I, I'm guessing the last time they did it, they probably had a converter box hooked up to an analog TV. The majority of the people I talked to now were using new equipment with built-in tuners uh, and perhaps just hadn't done that themselves. Thank you. Is there a question down here? Uh, Russ Lieberman with the American Cable Association. Uh, you know, first of all, congratulations. It's not easy to be the first to have to do this, and it seems like you've gone above and beyond uh, to make sure consumers are aware of the air, consumers are aware of the, uh, the need to, to rescan. Um, so my question goes to, in terms of uh, other cable or satellite operators in the marketplace, and sort of what steps did you take in order to inform 
uh, those particularly smaller ones, which my mep members largely represent. I understand that you said that you served them with a, you provided them a certified letter, but I'm wondering if there were any other steps that were taken and uh, what advice might you have for other broadcasters moving forward to avoid uh, people not, you know, cable operators maybe not knowing that this is happening? Uh, because they're not always welcome to calls, I would, you know, I mean, seriously, sometimes it's like you'd leave a call and go on return, so you know you did a certified letter you, that you sent, and, a, and in the case of the one that called, um, it, was, it was received well in advance and was signed by somebody in the office who didn't bother to tell the boss, we have this important letter for you. So I don't know how you overcome when somebody's not taking calls because there are fewer local offices and your call's going to Denver, for example. Um, you know, that's, that's something that needs to be thought about and worked out and cleaned up. But notification beyond a letter, uh, I think would be very beneficial, but I don't know that um, you know, anybody's office wants to receive hundreds of calls I don't know how to answer what could be done. In, in our market, um, and we're obviously a lot smaller than Milwaukee as far as the number of operators we're working with, we sent the letter and expected that the letter may never get to the person that actually had to do the technical change. Um, I, I, I believe we were pretty proactive with our operators. We routinely talked to them about other technical issues, so our engineers were talking to their technicians about when it was happening. We had some of them ask us, if we could light up our temp our new channel early, so they wouldn't have to wait till exactly 11 o'clock on the 31st to, to find us, so we were able to accommodate that a couple hours early. But I don't think we got any phone calls from anybody that that was unaware of it or or missed it. And no, I, Dave, we I, didn't. I, uh, the cable uh, uh, and DBS went well, and we really had few issues there. And I should add, add the same thing with with our folks. Some of our engineers had relationships with engineers at the provider, so they were having conversations like, you should let your bosses know, you know, and so they were having their conversations. But when I'm talking about the corporate office um, is where there's sometimes a roadblock. Yeah, Ross, obviously contact information is always a challenge. To get to the right person in the right role at the right company um, is, is hard. And uh, uh, we obviously have contact information in our databases, which the stations are using, but sometimes that's been put in for different purposes and it's probably not the right person. So obviously we've appreciated the work that your organization has done uh, to date to try to get your members aware of at least that this is happening and that they need to be on the lookout for it and obviously would welcome, based on this experience, um, further activity uh, and we'll work with you on that. Yeah, no, it, it's a shared interest. Yeah. Sure. I had a, a, a quick question, uh, actually maybe two quick questions. So one is um, just market size, you know, where, where are each of you in the DMA list? Because I think that helps give perspective sure. about the number of calls that you, you might get. Um, and then second, I know that um, WXOW had to mm -hmm. sort of side mount and power down. Uh, one of our partners, WIVB in Buffalo, had an experience where they relocated the tower location, which also brought about challenges of people who lived south of town, maybe used to get the signal, and now the tower's farther north. Um, so if you could just talk a little bit more about how you message to that specific issue, um, as opposed to the general information of rescan and you'll find us. Um, I'll only say we're market 35 DMA. We're market 129. Okay. As far as the, the message of the, the lower power and the side mount, we didn't address that uh, to the general public because we knew it, was, it wasn't going to affect the majority of them. Uh, we addressed that when we got the phone calls, and then we would go into detail. And so the first question we asked everybody when we got them on the phone is, where are you calling from? And then we knew right away if they were calling from 60 miles away in a, in a notoriously bad area for reception, we knew we were gonna deal with a different issue than somebody that was five miles away just, that just didn't know how to rescan. Um, but we did that on a case-by-case -case basis. The 220 calls we got, we figure is 1% of the over-the-air households. It's almost exactly 1% 
of the number of over-the-air households that exist in the market. I, I think that's, that's really helpful information, and I especially appreciate the sort of knowledge of asking people where they're calling from as a starting point for the conversations. I think that's something that hopefully other stations will internalize and, and build into their efforts. I also wanted to say that I appreciated the fact on the websites that you not only have the videos, but you also have text descriptions. So for people who are accessing that on a, on a mobile device or, or may not have high-speed internet at home, um, being able to just read through the text description of what's going on, I think, is, is critically important um, and not overly relying on videos. And I will plug also that I know um, one of the, the major broadcasters in New York was able to put up screenshots of the different menus for a couple of the major types of television providers. So, you know, Samsung, and it was sort of, this is the main menu, this is the sub-menu that you're looking for, and then this is the, you know, hit OK to rescan. Uh, so I, I would throw that out there, too, as another sort of best practice or, or something for broadcasters to keep in mind. Okay. Um, any other questions for our panelists or for us? Hearing none, I want to really thank Bowden and you for coming into town mm -hmm. to tell us about this, um, and also Brady and, and uh, uh, um, Dave, I'm sorry having a brain, brain freeze here. Um, but, but thank you for, for joining us. This is really helpful. As I said, this is really helpful to us because um, the more information we can, we can garner, the better we can help. Uh, we do have, uh, at, here at the commission, we have set up uh, a, a number of regional coordinators on the staff of the Media Bureau who are working with stations in particular regions so that we can uncover issues and problems but also reach out to them and help them uh, you know, with, with their planning. Um, and so stations, I hope, are going to be relying on that, and we'll be able to reach them through those channels and know when they're, they're going to go. So I think that'll be helpful. But anyway, thank you very much. We thank really you. appreciate it. I'll turn it over to you. And thank you. Again, thank you to the panelists, and thank you to Jean and Charlie for joining us. And I have a feeling that we'll probably be seeing you back <laughs> as, as we continue through this yeah. process. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah other auctions and things see, happening as well. Right. So I, I may still be wearing my capi D DC Capitals red jacket. <laughs> there, there, there you go. There you go. I'm never going to take it off. Of course. <laughs> Thank you both. Thank you. So I think next on the agenda we have uh, time for comments from the public. I didn't see any through Twitter. I'm not sure if you or Catherine nope. got any in nope. advance. Okay. So, um, so I, I think we'll move quickly past comments from the public. Uh, Scott, have we set a date for the next meeting? Oh, let me get this microphone. Uh, yes, we have. Uh, the next uh, plenary meeting of the CAC will be October 19th. And that's, and that's the last meeting of this, this term. That's a, a Friday, so it's Friday, October 19th. Our charter ends... I believe on like the 25th the, the or 21st. 21st of October. Yeah, something like that, um, yeah. So it's, it's just before the, the charter expires. Um, and then I, I would assume as soon as information is available about reapplying or, or right. the next version of the CAC. Scott we will put that up on, on the list as soon as we have uh, information about that process. Sure. Any other wrap up items? Any other wrap up items? I. I want to thank you for all coming today and hope you found these excellent panels uh, interesting. I did, for sure. Um, and if we'll be around, uh, Ed and I, uh, and Catherine during the breakout sessions this afternoon uh, to help you get to the rooms and stuff, or if you have any questions. Um, and you can always call me on my cell phone if if uh, I'm not in the place I'm supposed to be. <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, you got a... I, I got a couple quick things. Oh, so, we got, um, we got, again, okay. I want to thank Ross and ACA for providing Absolutely. breakfast and lunch today. Coffee was exceptionally critical given the, uh, the late night many people had. Right. So a, a big thank you there. Um, we're going to have lunch available in the commission room next and yes. have our standard sort of hour lunch break. Uh, starting at 1 o'clock, we're going to have two of the four working groups meeting. Um, USF Digital Inclusion will be here in the CMR. Uh, the robocalls working group will be in TWA 
uh, 402, 402, 404, 442, down the, uh, hall. down the hall, and we'll make sure that people can find that and get there. For those of you who are on the phone, each of the working groups has call-in information for today. Um, it should have been in your meeting packet that Scott, well, it was in your meeting packet that Scott sent you. If you don't still have that and need that information sent to you again, please yeah. reach out to Scott or myself right. uh, through email or, or through a phone call, and we'll make sure that you get that. Uh, from 2 to 3 o'clock, the Broadcast Repack Working Group is going to be here in the CMR, and the Slamming Cramming Group is going to be in 402, 442 down the hall. Um, we staggered them because I know many of you are on multiple working groups, and we wanted to give people an opportunity to participate in a, in a few places. Uh, so that, that's and, sort of the schedule for the afternoon. And you should also be aware that the Repack Group meeting... Uh, uh, this afternoon is going to have um, a panel of FCC staff who had real life experience with the DTV transition and they're going to be talking about ideas and sharing with you uh, ideas about what was learned there that might be relevant to the repack situation. And then slamming is having an FCC staff person, in fact the author of the slamming order that was passed yesterday. We'll be talking to them during their working group, uh, doing a short overview of the of the particular order. And um, just so to be clear, the working groups are are not open to the public, and they they will not be broadcast. So this is the conclusion of the the public portion of the meeting. Uh, so I think we'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. Thank you. In favor. Opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> All right, I think we're good. <laughs> Enjoy Thanks, lunch. Everybody. Take care.